For my money, and maybe your money, Peter Apple, the best position in baseball will be ranked today on the Just Baseball Show. It is top 10 third baseman in the game. Jack McMullen, Peter Apple, Just Baseball Show on the final day of February. It is Tuesday, February 28th. Also going to give you my now daily spring training overreaction. I've got three more guys that I got to shout out. Uh, Peter, man, big personal news video put out on Twitter. Give the plug now. Yeah. What's this thing about the club of wins that you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So it's called Dub Club. And I made this point um, on my Twitter. And before I even get into it, I want everybody to know that everything that has been happening is continuing to happen with the not gambling advice. Except you're... everything. It's all going behind a paywall. Nope. So <laughs> the articles, podcasts on not gambling advice, the TikToks, posts on Twitter, it's all going to stay the same. What I've done is I've opened up a service called Dub Club. The link is in the episode description if you choose to sign up. It's 83 cents a day, $24.99 a month once the season starts right now it's free to join and what's available on that service is my player props projections on prize picks i i gathered every player listed on prize picks for home runs strikeouts hits and era and gave you kind of a primer like they should go over they should go under based on a lot of past data did a bunch of that stuff i'm really excited to do live betting this year because unfortunately i can't make a tiktok when there's a live bet where i'm like oh, I think this team is going to go over and it's the third inning. Like we got to get it out. That's going straight to subscribers. And what you're doing is you're paying for convenience. Basically, you don't have to go around looking at the website, listening to the podcast, watching still do the TikToks all that or anything. Shit. Yeah, still do of it. course, still do that stuff. And of course, but this gets them texted to immediately. So you can save on juice over the past two seasons, MLB, NFL, everything has been completely free and it stays free. At least what you're seeing now but you're basically paying for added benefits plus the convenience of getting it texted to you like that and 83 cents a day. You know, I can't promise anything because of course you never want to promise anything in an industry like this, but I I can say that I'm going to make up the value for you. I can almost guarantee that I've made it up myself from live betting alone. That doesn't even include all the prize picks projections. I was going to say, so like, um, unit obviously i i still know the term unit and and your unit size is just like what your average bet is yeah so like if you are a very low stakes person your unit size may be a dollar if you're very high stakes you're a hundred dollars i bet a lot of you are somewhere in between that um if your unit size is like two dollars you're gonna make that back every day i think i think so too and um well, just to clarify, unit is 1% of your bankroll. So good betting practices. Yeah, you, you should set, like, let's say, set a number that you'd be willing to lose. Like, if you have $10,000 in your bank account, your bankroll shouldn't be $10,000. Maybe it's $1,000 or something like that. So 1% of a $1,000 bankroll is $10. Right. So if you're if you're okay with losing a thousand dollars, ten dollars should be your unit. If it's ten thousand, that's a hundred, something like that. So just to uh clarify that. But yeah, this is a service that a lot of people have signed up for already. And I'm really excited because I'm going to do my best to hit it out of the part. Absolutely. If if we're at a point where you're able to support me through all this, all this extra work that I'm putting in, I'm going to make sure you see the value. And that's all that there is to it, basically. Like, I'm really, really excited for this. A lot of people are very happy with the player prop projections. I even got some texts that people are like, yeah, I'm excited for the MLB bets, but I'm actually using the prop projections for fantasy baseball, right? Because there's a bunch of projections. A lot of people want to see, you know, a guy's ERA projection or how many home runs he might hit based on all the data that I put in. So there's a lot of different use cases for it. And like I said, completely free right now free until opening day so you can see those projections right now if you sign up now and you can cancel any time it's not like you sign up and you sell your life away completely free right now last thing um and like i need an honest answer here is it like i don't i don't bet you know that but is it a bad friend move for me not to subscribe because i may subscribe anyway i like i i value your friendship to me at 24.99 a month that's fair. No, I've, of course I'll take you. 
of course I'll yeah. take you and I'm going to provide value for you. Like I, I don't mean Sometimes. to bask in my own glory a little bit, but since the start of opening day, 2021, I am up 100.08 units between the NFL and the MLB. So let's say your unit size was $10. I've turned that into a thousand dollars. Basically, if you had tailed all of my picks since April 1st opening day, and that's not even including we've made a couple units in college baseball so far, which is, of course, a part of the subscription. You're getting texted those college baseball bets instantly to you as soon as I make them so you can save on juice. Another thing, let's say I put out a bet for Fullerton today. Hopefully they win. You're hearing this the day after. Hopefully Fullerton beat Michigan today. I gave it out at plus 115. If you had gone on my social media a couple hours later, it's a plus 105. So that little thing, depending on your unit, can mean a lot. So you're saving juice on that too. And by the time you know you hear the article podcast, something might go from minus 120 to minus 130. It happens all the time. So you're also saving on that too. So there it is. Does this mean it's gambling advice now? No, never. It can't be. It's not gambling advice. Yeah, that's fair. College ball. I saw Maui Ahuna tweet that he's back. Yeah, that's big thing going on. for the balls. Yeah. Yeah, big thing going Maui, on in Tennessee. Maui Ahuna, like projected first round pick, is the shortstop for Tennessee. Was at Kansas last year. Uh, Tony Vitello, who's the the manager for Tennessee, was or the head coach, I guess, in college. It's a head coach in Pro Bowl. It's the manager, uh, but the head coach of Tennessee was suspended for the weekend series. Yeah, he is now back, and their shortstop, their first round pick, is back as well. So if anybody is going to challenge the LSU Tigers. It may be Tennessee. It may be your pick, Wake Forest. It's been really fun to keep up on on college baseball and college softball. Uh, I've been watching a shit ton of spring training, though. I've got three guys that I want to overreact about. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's overreactions were Mackenzie Gore, Reed Detmers, and Zach Veen. Mm -hmm. Ready for my three now? I'm ready for three now. I also have a couple, too, to throw at you. Okay. Uh, Brandon Fott was the truth today for Arizona. Fought two innings, a one-hit ball, punched out two. He was slicing and dicing. Uh, Fott, I think Fangraphs put him ahead of Grayson Rodriguez, which I love watching Fott. Probably wrong, but he is one of the better pitching prospects in baseball, and he looked like it today. Yeah, I had an even bigger overreaction to him. I said he's the next Aaron Nola. Jesus. Um, because yeah, his arm slot that. was kind of similar, and he was is similar at Velo, and he had two innings. Similar hair. Similar, yeah, similar hair, hair too. Like scruffy facial hair, yeah. Like, Rhett Lauder at Wake Forest looks a lot like Kevin Gosman to me. Brandon fought in that two-inning spurt in spring training. Looked like Aaron Nola, so I'm ready to say Aaron Nola is Brandon fought. Yeah, and Paul Skeens at LSU looks a lot like me when I threw in high school. Yeah, like a combination of you and I. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Like he's got, <laughs> he's got my physique, six, six, two sixty, just carved. Like, looks like he could, you know, pilot a fighter jet at, at air force right now. Um, and then he kind of throws like you, right. Where it's a hundred. <laughs> it's a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> like um, me. <laughs> all right. Second takeaway. I'm saving like my most intriguing one. This is like the most boring one far and away. I think Tim LeCastro can, can break the Mets opening day roster. Two for three. He seems like a decent bat against left-handed pitching. We know he can run. He's from Auburn, New York. I spent a summer in Auburn, New York. We are united by the Finger Lakes. Uh, Timmy Lowe looked decent, man. Um, Well, Timmy Lowe, former New York Yankee legend, um, is still one of the fastest players in baseball. The one thing I'm looking up right now is Brandon Nimmo's splits um, because you're right. He can probably hit lefty pitching, but I'm curious because he probably should play center field considering how good he's been in spring training. I mean, find another guy who's hitting 667 right now. Uh, Brandon Nimmo hit, had a 786 OPS against lefties last year. Um, Brandon Nimmo hit 264 against lefties. LaCastro is hitting 667. I think the answer is kind of clear. Maybe a platoon. Right. Feels like it. I mean, Cohen has like the money. It. Cohen has the money. Might as well put out the best product possible. We're good, man. Give give Tim LeCastro like a 10-year, $12 million deal. <laughs> I think it's probably worth it. I think it is too. Get him, get those. Uh, you can make it backloaded. Speed's going to keep playing. Why not, man? Speed ages like fine wine. We know that. We know right. that. La last one and like definitely the most notable big leaguer we've got here. Brendan Donovan has had mm. a rip-roaring start to the spring. <laughs> Five at-bats, three hits, two bombs, five RBIs, 
Donovan has played second. He's played third. It was fun to watch Mason win at short earlier today. But let me tell you, man, Donovan is going to get a chance to bounce all over the place with Arenado going to the WBC, Goldschmidt going to the WBC, and like things being, and Tommy Edmond going to the WBC, um, and, and a couple other guys, you know, like jostling for position. Like we're going to see some middle infield tandems of Donovan and Win for the Cardinals in spring training. And I think if Brendan Donovan has a good spring training, he can turn into one of the most valuable St. Louis Cardinals. I think the defensive versatility is pretty much unmatched in Major League Baseball. And I think that if this guy can do a 400 OBP again, he can be an incredibly valuable player. And I think he could have an all-star in there somewhere. My only issue with that is that take was too regular and too good sounding. And like, that makes sense. You have to say the NL MVP is returning to St. Louis in the hands of Brendan Donovan. Brendan Donovan. Yeah. So how about this? Because what you said makes all the sense in the world. I thought we're overreacting here. Okay. I, like I, I just said, Brandon fought as Aaron Nola after two innings. Let me find another. Oh, put Wander Franco in the Hall of Fame now. Three Good. for three, there four ribbies. <laughs> yeah, there we go. You okay. know who else? You know who else we should put in the Hall of Fame? Bobby Dalbeck is hitting a thousand. I'm out. Yeah. Well, and for that reason, I'm out. Let's over, let's overreact quickly. Four thousand OPS. That's. And for that reason, I'm out. <laughs> okay. All right. Next one. This one you might be less prone to not overreacting. Did I put that right? No, but keep going. You know what I mean. Anthony Volpe is going to be as good as Derek Cheater. And the reason okay. I say that, still two bases. Yes. <laughs> Way better. Still two <laughs> bases in spring training. Looked great. Hit a ball hard. And there was a story that went out in The Athletic that he was speaking with Austin Wells. And Austin Wells said that he has an incredible competitor within him that when they're playing ping pong, he turns on a switch and he's the biggest competitor in there. And he puts that on the field. So combined with the propaganda from The Athletic and him stealing two bases in in a game in spring training, Derek Cheater. Uh, oh, shout out Emmanuel Rivera hitting a three-run homer in the bottom of the ninth, walk-off winner, 3 nothing Diamondbacks over the Cubs. Congratulations, wow. Emmanuel Rivera. Baseball's back, baby. I love <laughs> yeah. the push notifications. Um, all right. I, that makes I sense. Love how, I love how every story about like a guy's competitive fire has to do with clubhouse ping pong. It's Always. every single story. I've heard that maybe 40 times. That guy's so competitive on the ping pong table. I mean, when we, you know, we talked to players like we we spoke with Tucker Davidson, who, of course, uh, when he was on the Braves, he was talking about the ping pong in the Braves locker room. It seems like once they get off the field, all big league players do, they get straight to the ping pong table. They're it's not the most fascinating off the field stuff in our sport. It's really just so, competitive ping pong, and whoever wins those tends to be the best player in Major League Baseball for their team. So I, I love the NBA because the culture there is like nightclub, strip club culture, and, and the culture in baseball is ping pong culture. Take your pick. Which one would you rather be? <laughs> <laughs> Take your All pick. Right. <laughs> Top 10 three, uh, third baseman? I think we're ready. I think we've done okay. enough now. <laughs> I think so, too. Uh, naturally, we start with three honorable mentions. But again, I think this is the most loaded list that we have. And, and the three honorable mentions are are indicative of that. Um I think shortstops could could fall off a little bit. Um, Third base, I mean, it's just so dumb strong. And the top six are crazy. Um, You know, you see seven, eight, nine, and 10, it's like, eh. But then you think about 11 through 13, and it all of a sudden that jumps up, and it might be the best 11 through 13 that we've got at any position. So our three honorable mentions, Key Brian Hayes with the Pirates, Max Muncy with the Dodgers, Anthony Rendon, pardon, with the LA Angels. I want to start with Rendon because he is the elephant in the room because he could be as high as four on this list if he gets back to the Anthony Rendon of old. Um, But he's an honorable mention right now because he played 47 games, hit 229, and slugged under 400 a year ago. Uh, He was 18% K rate, 12% walk rate. He was a fine defensive third baseman, but this guy just has not been healthy enough to play meaningful games. Yeah, no, I I totally get you. I mean, from 2017 to 2020, it was hard to find a better third baseman. 
from 2017 to 2018, 140 WRC plus each of those two seasons. Then 2019, 150 WRC plus. Then 2020, 152 WRC plus. I know it was in a shortened season, but he played the entirety. I mean, I think he missed eight games of 2020. It's been the last two seasons where his production has just taken a nosedive. He's been a league average hitter. He's been a slightly above average defender to DRS last year in like 47 games. I mean, that's pretty good, but like this just hasn't looked like the Anthony Rendon. But I think, um, you know, we were talking about it earlier, a full glass a full glass half full approach would look like us putting him in the top 10 because we know that when he's right, he's one of the best third baseman in baseball, but then a glass half empty approach is he shouldn't even sniff this list based on the last two years, which we do take in more <clears throat> consideration than other years, but it's just so hard to leave a talent like that guy off this list so I think the honorable mention is the spot for him. And a goatee like that. It's impossible to leave a goatee like that off the list. You're not wrong either. Now, Rendon, with how good of a defender he is and how good of a hitter he is when he's healthy, if we get a fully healthy Anthony Rendon and we finally see the Angels prophecy fulfilled and Shohei signs a, a 10-year, $120 million deal with the Angels to stay uh, <laughs> because he's so bought into the product, um, I mean, seriously, what does a healthy Rendon's 2023 season look like? And the, and the answer is TBD if he can get back to that $300 million contract year that he put together in Washington. Like, can he be a seven-war player? Maybe. Could he be a two-and-a-half win player? Maybe. Yeah. He That's the thing. Could. We're so far removed from anything that the answer is a big fat, I don't know. Yeah, I put him on my top 100 because I was like, I can't not have him on because what if he goes but crazy? You put, put him at like 97. Yeah, 98 maybe. Yeah, or 90 yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. Because it's Whoa. a big fat, I don't know. It's a big, it's the biggest fattest, I don't know. I think of any player that we rank on our list besides guys that like, you heard the first baseman list with Vinny Pascantino. You're going to hear a rookie on this one. Besides those guys, this player and Anthony Rendon is the hardest player to rank, I think, on any list. Yes, 100%. Next one is Max Muncy. Mm -hmm. Muncy had a weird-ass 2022. He's been so good for so long. All of a sudden, he's a two-and-a-half win player with a 106 WRC+, plus, which is so far below what we see him at consistently. 25% K rate, 16% walk rate. He hedged with walks, but the problem was he hit a buck 96. He slashed 196, 329. 384 in 136 games Muncie had the worst year of his career since coming over to LA um I don't know if he bounces back or not I think that he hits above 200 for sure um but the question remains to be seen can he recapture the Max Muncie of 2019 2020 and 2021 the thing is I believe we ranked him too low I think he should be a top 10 guy um, because remember, he was coming back from the Tommy Elbow. John surgery, right? Yeah. I think he had a torn UCL. And he obviously had a dreadful first half. Slash 164, 320, 319. The power was gone. He looked like he was using his bat as a prop. Like he was just putting it on his shoulder. And then just it was so it hard to watch it, the first couple months. So hard. He was just leaving fastballs down the middle. It looked like it was painful to even take the bat off of his shoulder. That's why yeah. I call it a prop. It looked like he was just going up there like in the bench warmers when I think Howie kneels behind the catcher. That's what it looked like. It was terrible to watch him. But then the second half, he looked pretty good. Post-All-Star break, slash 230, 340, 451. We've seen, like you said, 2019, 2020, 2021. He's been great. Then he had a horrible first half off of a bad elbow. I think he should be in our top 10. I'm fine with him in the honorable mentions. I'm not upset about it because the guys in our top 10 are freaking loaded and they've been doing it and they did it last season. That's why I'm okay with it. But if you ask my true feelings, I think he's going to go back to what he was, or at least 90% of what he was, which would easily be a top 10 third baseman. He's 11 for me. 
Okay. As of right now, he's 11 for me, just because like the bat has been so strong for so long. 2018 was his first full MLB season. He's played four full MLB seasons, 130 games played or more. OPS by year, 973, 889, 895, 713. Home run output by year, 35, 35, 36, 21. Things went to shit for him in 22. If he gets back to a 900 OB or 900 OPS and 35 home runs, hell, dude, he's he's six or seven on this list. That's my thing, though. If he even doesn't do the 900 OPS, we saw the second half resurgence. I mean, it wasn't quite to that level, 791 OPS. Yeah, but there was clear, clearly more power. I mean, in 226 ABs, 12 home runs compared to nine and 238 ABs. He had 14 doubles compared to eight doubles, 451 slugging compared to 319. If that can come back, even if he's an 820 OPS guy, seven defensive runs saved at the position last year, this guy is still a really good third baseman. I yeah. think that's why I'm higher on him. That's why I think he should be in the top 10 is because even if he doesn't get back to the Max Muncy of old, he still should make this list based on what he's done in the past. And we're kind of, lowering him because he came off an elbow injury and had a dreadful first half. Like, I know you're reading me the numbers, how much worse it was. And I know, but it's just on data. the backs of a, of a really bad first half off an injury when the second half showed um, some highlights. So I'm, I'm a lot higher on Muncie than I think the rest of just baseball is. I mean, maybe there's some people who agreed with me, but I got out, out talked out of. So. He's also just a bit more stubbier of a guy than Rendon and, and Key Brian Hayes. So maybe the, the stubbiness turns some people off of Max Muncy. Yeah, you're into uh, you don't love guys who somewhat resemble a couch. No, I love hot bods, man. <laughs> you're a hot guy. You have a hot guy syndrome. <laughs> I do have a hot guy syndrome. Number uh, eight on our list is hot. I'll just get that out of the way early. Maybe Orioles fans. I don't fans even remember. Eight. What I'm I saying. can't wait to scroll down on my one note to see who number eight is. I wrote the article too. I don't remember. <laughs> um, all right. Last honorable mention, Key Brian Hayes with the Pittsburgh Pirates. If this guy was a 110 WRC plus guy, he's the sixth best third baseman in baseball, I think. He is arguably the best defender at any position in all of baseball. 24 defensive runs saved, 18 outs above average. Nolan won the gold glove because of the narrative thing around Nolan Arenado. Key Brian Hayes graded out better than him in almost every advanced metric. The problem is the guy couldn't hit 88 WRC plus 136 games slash 244, 314, 345. Seven homers and 41 driven in in 136 games. 20 stolen bases. He was a three win player. If this guy's a league average hitter, he's a top 10 third baseman, and there's no question about it. I know Arm is expecting the jump to league average hitter. He's expecting a jump into the top 10 in this list. What say you? Because I'm torn. <laughs> he would be of my honorable mentions, the last honorable mention for me, um, because you're right, and Arm's right. Lift the ball, my friend. Lift the ball. Because you hit the ball hard, it's just always on the ground. You have a platinum glove, at least how I see it. I yes. totally agree with you. One of the best defenders in the entire sport. But can you lift the ball? 49.4% ground ball rate. And yes, you could say, well, he lowered it from 2021 when it was 57.4%. But it's still higher than what he posted in 2020. If this guy consistently hits the ball on the ground like this, and it's not just, you know, he's hitting the ball on the ground only. Like, he hits some line drives, but there's no fly ball in his game. And you need the fly ball in his game to get the ball out of the ballpark. You know, he he hits the ball hard, but it's not, you know, so, so incredibly hard that he could just make it up by line drives and just hit line drives out of the park like an O'Neill Cruz or Giancarlo Stanton. He's still almost in the upper 10th of baseball and hard hit rate, but it's not quite there where I see Cabrian Hayes becoming this above average hitter. I don't. I think he could be average, but we just haven't seen it yet. Like it's all this. Yeah, if he hits more fly balls, he gets the ball in the air a little bit more, increases that launch angle, then yes, 
then do it, right? Do it. I got to see it. And it's not like we're dealing with a Brian Hayes that's 23. It's 26. Like, do it now, please. Because then it's like, all right, is that just the player that we have? So from the past three seasons, the data I have to bet on is that he might improve a little bit, but not enough to be a 105 WRC plus. Because also that's an 88 WRC plus at a premium hitting position. What's the average WRC plus for a third baseman? It's higher than 100. So for his position, he's even lower than an 88 WRC plus compared to his position. So that is what would put him at 13 for me if we were to rank these guys, rank the honorable mentions. So I, I think Key Brian Hayes is going to be in the two or the three hole for the Pirates this year. Mm-hmm. But if you if you took him and plopped him on a contending team, where is he in the batting order? Probably seventh. Yeah. Like Eighth. it's hard to put a seven hitter as a top 10 third baseman in the game. Yeah. Like I'm just thinking where would he – where would he be on the swap him? Swap him in for Josh Donaldson, right? Swap him in for Donaldson on the Yankees. Where is he hitting in that Yankee lineup? Um, well, you got I'll Judge. Roll through, I'll roll through what Fangraphs has right now. Okay, Torres leading off. Yeah, whatever. Uh, he's judged... better than Gabrine Hayes. Like he's yeah. a better hitter than Gabrine Hayes. Yes. Okay. So Torres leading off. Judge in the two hole. Rizzo batting third. Stanton four. Uh, Donaldson's currently five right now, but you've got Bader, Hicks, Peraza, Trevino. I think Hayes is the six or seven hitter on that team. Yankees kind of suck. That's not a great lineup. <laughs> a little bit. They're kind of hot ass. And then you go to the rotation and it's Cole, Rodon, <laughs> Seve, and Nestor. So that's really good. No, they're that's their really lineup good. just isn't as flashy as I guess it may seem. But yeah, I was. I was just thinking well, in my head. Well, take LeMahieu, right? Slap yeah. LeMahieu in the lineup. How about Oswald yeah. Cabre- or Oswaldo Cabrera instead of uh Yeah, he Hicks. hits he did sixth or seventh on this team. Yeah. Damn, that's, that's that all we got to say. So, like, Platinum Glover, like, the path is so easy for Hayes to get into the top 10. It's just be a league average hitter. Be a 100 WRC plus guy. But if he checks in at 88 again this year, all of a sudden he turns into the Kevin Pillar type guy and not – a Nolan Arenado type guy. I don't, I don't think he'll ever be Nolan, but um, you know, it's, it's just a different type of conversation where you are top flight or you're Kevin Kiermaier. What was Hayes's OPS last year? Hayes's OPS, his WRC plus was 88. His OPS was 659. Yeah. Like Ramon Arias of the Orioles had a 719 OPS and won the gold glove in the American league at third base. Like, I mean, 655, that sucks. Can we be honest? That sucks. Yeah, I mean, it's bad. bench bad if he's not an elite hitter or if he's he, if he's not an elite defender. Yeah, so. All right, Yandy Diaz, horrible defender. But man, can he get on base? And he's the 10th best third baseman in baseball. 137 games last year, hit 296 with a 401 OBP, a 423 slug, nine homers, 57 RBIs. 3.8 F4, a 146 WRC plus, 14% K rate, 11% walk rate, but negative 14 defensive run saved, negative eight outs above average. Yandy Diaz is an on base machine and he can hit the ball really hard on a line. He doesn't put the ball out very often and he's not a good defender, but he is, in my opinion, a top 10 third baseman in baseball just because he provides so much to a lineup. Yeah, and I think Yandi versus Cabrian Hayes is is an interesting discussion here uh, because Yandi has a 50% ground ball rate. He's basically at a 50% or higher ground ball rate his entire career. And in terms of the batted ball profile, like where the balls are going, whether they're fly balls or line drives, he hits more fly balls, but it's not that much. But I think what's the difference and what leads to an 88 WRC plus for Cabrian and what leads to a 146 for Yandi last year is the fact that Yandy Diaz has some of the best plate discipline in the entire sport. Like, talk about a 401 on-base percentage. Like, he got on base 40% of the time. It's incredible. And, yeah, he had nine home runs, which isn't ideal, but 33 doubles, which I think is a big difference. So that's why he hits a lot of balls hard. Like, he hits the ball harder 
than Cabrian Hayes. About a mile and a half an hour harder. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the deal that we're working with here, that uh, Yandy hits the ball harder, has a better batted ball profile, and has much, much, much better plate discipline. But Cabrian has the glove, and I guess what's more valuable to you? Personally, I'd take Yandy Diaz, because this is also trending up for Yandy Diaz, even though he's 31 years old. The Rays really like what they saw, offering him that three or $24 million extension, which yeah. is not really in the Rays' blood. And actually, it has been, I guess, over the past <clears throat> maybe season. Have they done it this offseason? Yeah. But yeah, Yandy Diaz, he doesn't play much defense, but from a plate discipline profile, from a shooting balls in the gap, this guy is hes a top 10 third baseman. Again, I'd have Muncie over him and probably Rendon, but I like him. I like him a lot. He's a scary hitter in the Rays' lineup. I think when you ask the Diaz or Hayes question, it depends on what team and what situation and what you need from your third baseman. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that a lot of good teams with a lot of offensive firepower elsewhere would rather have Key Brian Hayes because he is a platinum glove level defender. But I think he, Yandy Diaz is perfect for Tampa because this is a team that figures it out with a bunch of relative quote unquote, no names, right? Like Jose Siri is going to be an everyday center fielder for them. Um, and while I think Jose Siri is an MVP candidate, you may not think so, um, no. but like, man, I mean, they're, they're throwing people in the lineup that I think a lot of casual baseball fans will say who, and Yandy Diaz is another one of those guys. You need somebody on base in, in those types of situations. And Yandy Diaz does a great job getting on base for a lineup that is not as star studded as you typically see at the top of divisions. Yeah. And he's pretty fast too. So when he gets on base, he can <clears throat> provide some value uh, on the base pass. Yeah. He's a solid player. I like him. Uh, do I think he takes a slight step back offensively? Yeah. But do yes. I think he improves slightly defensively? I also do. It's just, he's got a freaking noodle over there. I've seen his arm. It sucks. Yeah. With, with like, with how beefy of a guy he is, yeah. I'm stunned that he's got a little noodle boy. Yeah, literally a noodle boy. He's got a freaking foam noodle at third. <laughs> Eugenio Suarez is number nine with the Seattle Mariners. Gino, 150 games and talk about a bounce back, baby. 240 hitter, 330 OBP, and a 460 slug. 31 homers, 87 driven in. He was a 4.1 win player with a 131 WRC+. plus. Yes, he struck out. Gino Suarez is always going to strike out 31% K rate, but 12% walk rate. And you know what? He was passable at third base. I think Gino gets a bad rap defensively because of how miserable he was at short for the Reds when they put him there. But when you put him at third, he's fine. And that power is hard to come by at this position. Yeah, it is. And so to unveil the curtain a little bit, when we were first going over these rankings and, you know, someone mentioned Gino, yeah, Eugenio Suarez in the top 10. I, I was like, what? No, like, no, he's not. Look at his 2021 with the Reds. He had a 714 OPS at 198. But then I kind of looked deeper into it. And then I realized a Eugenio Suarez since like 2018, I think is in the top. What? Three in home runs in Major League Baseball, or he's at least maybe at the top of the list. He had 49 in 2018. Is that yeah. right? He 34, then 49, then 15 in the shortened season, then 31, then 31 again. And he had 236 last year with a 791 OPS, driving in a ton of runs and playing pretty good defense. That's what led to the 4.1 F4. He was a four win player last year. Like Nico Horner was a four win player last year. Even if Suarez, like, that's a great year. And I think, and like, there's that, no like, reason that he shouldn't continue, right? No, and, and it shows that all you have to do is be passable defensively. You know what I mean? Like He's Suarez ages Yandi too, so it's not like oh this we got a Eugenio Suarez year in age thirty five where he just randomly hit a bunch of home runs. No, like this is a he probably found a home that he really likes, and it's much harder to hit in Seattle, and he still hit really well. He's like, Other thing, he doesn't miss games. Games no, played no. since twenty sixteen. 159, 156, 143, 159, 57 out of 60 in 2020, 145, 150. He's always on the field. He has the chance to to rack up the home run numbers. And when a guy plays a full season, it's fair to look at the 162-game average 
He's averaging 32 homers and 89 driven in per 162 in his career. So much like Reese Hoskins that Arm and I discussed yesterday, he's kind of a walking 30 homer guy. Yeah, and he, not only that, he strikes out a ton, which we have to acknowledge, 31% strikeout rate, but he offsets it with a walk rate above 11%. Yeah. I mean, that's really good. Like, if you're going to strike out that much, at least counteract it with the walks. And he does it, and he has the power, and he's a solid defender. He's one of the leaders on the Mariners team who I expected to do really, really well this year. So the more I looked into it, I was like, yeah, like, maybe I'd have Muncie over him, maybe Rendon, but Suarez I would have over Yandy for sure. That's why I like him at nine. I think this is a good spot for him. This feels like a... uh... This feels like a punch me in the face bet that I would have made when this trade went through. Like if if you tried to tell me that Suarez was going to be the better Mariner over Jesse Winker, yeah, I would have been like, crazy. if you believe that, you can punch me in the face if that comes true. But like I would be sitting here with a shiner if that was the case. I'd be sitting here with two shiners because I didn't freaking believe it at all. But look at it. Look at us. That's We got to start. <laughs> Listen, this year is going to be the year of punch in the face bets. I mean, that's on you. Like I'm, no, I'm gonna... all about it. Yeah. I'm, for some reason, I'm all about just getting a, a jab to the the nose. Sick freak. <laughs> yeah, I mean Suarez. I I think that he's going to be a great veteran presence for them. He's also 31 years old. He feels yeah. like he's 36. But that's what I was saying. Uh, I know you mentioned that. Yeah, it's um, not just some right. random 35 year old season from Suarez. We're like, oh look at that. That was kind of cool. No, exactly. It's 31. Exactly. It's pretty good. Total flip side at number eight, Gunnar Henderson, who may mm. play a bit more short than third, but we decided to put him at third because we think that the lineup is going to change a bit with Jorge Mateo playing short and maybe a Westberg coming up and playing short as well. Um, we think that Henderson may be the third baseman, but Gunnar Henderson is the eighth best third baseman in baseball going into his rookie year with the Baltimore Orioles. He got a very brief cameo with the Orioles at the major league level, 34 games, but he slashed 259, 348, 440, four homers, 18 driven in. He already accumulated 0.8 F4 in 34 games. He had a 125 WRC plus. But what this guy did in minor league baseball made him the number two prospect on just baseball's top 100 and the number one prospect in the game on MLB pipelines. 112 games at the minor league level, double and triple this past year. 297, 416 OBP, 531 slug, Mm. 24 doubles, 7 triples, 19 homers, 76 RBIs, 22 backs. Mm. He had this breakout that pushed him from double to the bigs. I think a lot of people were expecting Gunner to be good. They weren't expecting Gunner to be possible future superstar and one of the two best prospects in the game. One thing I'm worried about Gunner and one thing I'm really excited about Gunner. Obviously, the easy answer is you just say you're really excited about the bat, obviously, because he's going to hit yeah. for a ton of power and he's going to have he might hit 300. Like we we know that uh, we don't have to even talk about that. One thing I'm nervous about is 57 percent ground ball rate and that ground ball rate. He's had a relatively high one in the minor leagues, if I'm not mistaken. And definitely correct me if I'm wrong. That's from what I remember reading about Gunnar Henderson, and then it carried over. But at the same time, he maintained a 440 slugging with that high ground ball rate. Um, So I'm not that nervous about it. It just is something to watch in his short cameo in Major League Baseball. But something I'm really excited to talk about, because I feel like nobody kind of talks about this with Gunnar Henderson, is his speed. You mentioned it yourself, 22 stolen bases in the minors in Major League Baseball in a very short stint. He had the same sprint speed, the highest sprint speed as Byron Buxton. That's how fast he can get up to. Like, so this guy, if he can give you 25 to 30 home run pop, 20 to 25 steals and get on base and have great plate discipline, 21 years old, could develop into one of the best third basemen in baseball, one of the best players in baseball similar ish to a Jose Ramirez. Really? If you think about it like that, I mean, a guy like Gunnar Henderson, there's nothing that he's bad at. Jose Ramirez has the speed. So does Gunnar has the power. So does Gunnar has the bat to ball. So does Gunnar has the defensive acumen. So does Gunnar. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, he kind of embodies the 300, 400, 500 slash line build. 
right? Where With he's going to hit 20 to 25. Ball. He's going to swipe 20 to 25 bags and he can hit 300. You mentioned the ground ball rate, 60% at the major league level, 50% in AAA, 40% in AA. So each level he would go up, it increased by about 10%. But to factor in what he did at the major league level, 92 and a half mile an hour average exit below a 34% hard hit rate with the banning of the shift. I, I mean, he can't hit the ball on the ground 60% of the time, okay. but like, if he's mid, yeah. if he's mid to high forties and he's hitting the ball that hard on the ground, they're still going to get through a good bit. I think. Oh, absolutely. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. If we're looking at, um, yeah, he pulled 40% of balls last year. Uh, but he still has, you know, in terms of the batted ball profile, hit 29% up the middle, 30% to the opposite field. Yeah, uh, so, so he like, still hit the ball to all fields, so it's not, like, crazy. But I right. agree with you. I mean, if that ground ball rate is in the mid to high 40s, which is still, you know, a little bit above average, I still think he can be an amazing hitter. And if if he lowered that, I mean, this he's got all no, the I potential mean, in the world. And he's 21. He's- yeah, he can be an amazing hitter. I think that he's going to be a really good hitter this year. The question is, is he going to be, you know, a threat for 30-30 in a couple of years? And and I think the answer is yes. And I think that a lot of prospect people think the answer is yes. I wouldn't disagree with you one bit. While hitting close to 300, yeah. while get it, putting up an on-base percentage close to 400, while slugging close to 500. Like, think about that player in your mind. I know it's a lot of conjecture, and I know a lot of people are probably listening to this and be like, Gunnar Henderson already, can you guys stop? Can we see what he does before we mount him on this list? Think about it. eight is not crazy. Like no. eight on a list like this, we haven't gotten to the real best third baseman in baseball yet. Like guys like Suarez, they have obvious holes, 31 years old. Yanni Diaz did it one season, but they're older. So we kind of give them more credit for league average production for a while and then a great season but like gunner we see the potential already and depending on how you like to rank lists you could make the argument gunner higher because of the potential that he has to be even better than some of the guys on the list it's hard to find space higher than that with what we're talking about yes like yes if if he does it we put him higher but right now, it's it's impossible to find space higher than this. And that's fine. But we're going to talk about number seven guy. Like, this guy's much more potential than our number seven guy. But number seven guy's done it for longer. And he has the safer profile because he's been here and done that. Yes. And this is the last guy before we get into a new hemisphere of yes. third base talent. Like, there are there is tier 1A, tier 1B, and then everybody else. And this is the last of everybody else. Yeah. Seventh best third baseman in the game is Matt Chapman with the Toronto Blue Jays. Of course, heading into a contract year, Matt Chapman's going to be the best player in baseball this year, naturally. And he's going to be a $250 million guy. But Matt Chapman last year played nearly the whole season, 155 games, hit 229, had a 324 OBP, slugged 433, 27 homers, 76 RBIs. But he was a 4.1 F4 guy. He had a 117 WRC plus, struck out in the high 20s, walked at 11%. And with platinum glove caliber Matt Chapman, you would think that the defensive metrics would speak to that. Two defensive runs saved, one outs above average. That was like slightly better than league average. I think the narrative around Matt Chapman is that he's an amazing defensive third baseman. And when we watch the ball games, we can see that he's an amazing defensive third baseman. So um, this is when I can discount the advanced metrics here. Or it's like Correa, right? It's like some guys can just have a down year defensively by the numbers, but that doesn't make them not a good defender anymore. We didn't see anything. I know Blue Jays fans probably didn't see anything where it's like, oh, we're, it's, we're concerned now. No, he's still getting to balls. He's still quick. He's still got the bazooka arm. Like, there's no reason with one year in 2022 to say, oh, now he's a bad defender. Like, that, I can't believe that. Yeah. I'm not. So you know. I'm, I'm negating the advanced numbers defensively here. He's one of the best defensive third basemen in the game, if not top three. Um, he struck out a lot. He still hit for power, but he's not going to hit for a high average. If he's a four win player on a down year, I'm cool with that from Matt Chapman. Yeah, he's kind of like uh, you take 90th percentile of Brian Hayes' defense and you take 90th percentile of Suarez's bat. Kind of That's the a damn good player. Yeah, it's a damn good player, and that's the seventh best third baseman in baseball. The only reason why he has to be seven, well, I just, 
you'll listen to the rest of the list and I can't you, make you an argument find for Chapman spot over. Chapman. Yeah, yeah, Chapman of old is in the tier 1B, but the Chapman last year is closer to the bottom of this list, not seven. That's our issue here. But again, you said it yourself, and maybe this is lazy on our part, but contract year, dude. He's going to go crazy. Like, of course, but he like, is. Or so at least he's going to get back to it. You say closer to the bottom of this list. I say 120 WRC+, plus, 117 WRC+, plus, and four wins. Yes, but Suarez had 4.1. Yeah, Chapman had, had a 146 4.1. WRC+, plus and a 3.8 war. Like, I might have taken that last year because of the down year in defensive metrics from Chapman. If we're just talking about last year, remember, I'm not saying it. I'm saying if we're judging up 2022... He's probably off this list, or maybe ten. Hmm. I don't know. Twenty-seven bombs and like. Swords had more homers. Defenses. Swords had more homers, and his defensive metrics were the same. Yeah, but like the the eye the eye test defense. I and I hate. Here come, the yeah, here you test, come. Here like, you come. Fuck, dude. No, but I, I agree with you. Like sometimes, that. like you, I agree with you. It you have to watch baseball, like. You have to see the players. And I agree with you. When I watch Matt Chapman. Social media commenters have taught me anything. It's that I don't know ball. Who gives a fuck? We're talking to each other. This is <laughs> we're having a baseball conversation. We're allowed to say what we see on the field. Well, I don't know ball, Peter. Yeah, they told yes, me you that. Do. You do know <laughs> ball and you see Chapman. And I agree with you. But if we're just judging off 2022, that's the reality up. Yeah. The reality. All right. Now Chapman. It, it even if he does get back to like the Matt Chapman of Oakland, he still may not touch number six. That's how good this is. And this yeah. is the start of tier one B Alex Bregman of the Houston Astros is the sixth best third baseman in baseball, 155 games slash 259, 366, 454, 23 homers, 93 driven in a five and a half win player with a 136 WRC plus he is one of the few that walks more than he strikes out. 13.5% walk rate, 11.5% K rate. He was fine metrically. Negative four defensive run save, five outs above average. Alex Bregman, always been the bat, and the bat came out to play in 2022. Yeah, you could realistically rank <laughs> three through six any way you want. You could put their names in a blender, whatever pops out. You're probably going to be right. I think the only reason he's at six on our list is because he did have that down year in 2021. And the rest of the guys haven't ever had a down year. But when Alex Bregman is right, you could make the argument he's number four. And I wouldn't I wouldn't say nothing because he's as talented as any third baseman in baseball from an all-around perspective, from plate discipline to power to fielding. His arm's fine. He's just a really, really sound baseball player. And he's a playoff performer, too. That motherfucker's always doing damage against my Yankees, that piece of shit. But I respect the hell out of him because he's a beast. And I know he's a beast. I still hate him, but he's a freaking manimal. Biggest change for Bregman. He was an elite breaking ball hitter from 2017 to 2019. He was oh, he, a dreadful breaking ball hitter in 2020 and 2021. He cheated. He was an elite breaking <laughs> ball hitter in 2022. Yeah. For all the conspiracy cheaters like I am, sometimes when I try not to like say it into a mic because it's not actual analysis, it's my biased brain being right. the yes. I believe you. hat stuff. The, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. There was a part of my brain was like, yeah, of course, because he was cheating. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> but then Doofus. he did it again. And that story in my head, I was like, well, what can I even say? Right. Like the 2022 Houston Astros are like the best thing to happen to me, the baseball enjoyer, because now like there's not really a villain that I have to, you know, watch anymore. Literally the worst thing to happen to my Yankee bias. The worst thing to happen. I know. Because I anything know. that I believed is now out the window. It yeah. Sucks. But Bregman hit 280 with a 530 slug against breaking balls this past year. So he was back to being great against breaking balls. Yeah. There's nothing he Are they cheating poorly. again? Yes. <laughs> My column. Yes. Are they cheating again? <laughs> uh, no, they're not cheating again. And Alex I don't think Bregman so. is the sixth best third baseman in the game. Yeah. Number five, Rafi Devers with the Boston mm -hmm. Red Sox. The first line of my write up in this article at justbaseball.com is. 
Only at third base will you find a $300 million man checking in behind four other players at his position. Good point. Rafi Devers, 141 games, hit 295 with a 358 OBP and a 521 slug. 27 homers, 88 driven in. He was a five-win player with a 140 WRC+, plus, struck out less than 20% of the time, walked 8% of the time, and he was only slightly below average defensively. That was, I think, the big thing to talk about with Devers. Like, batsman world-class since he debuted. He was horrible defensively. Horrible. And then this past year, while Xander Bogarts took a massive step up defensively at short, Rafi Devers took a little step up defensively at third. Metrically, yes. Can I say I test? Because it didn't look that great. No, but... it didn't look great. But you know what? It, it looked less shitty than it had in recent years. Like, it yeah. was horrible to watch unfold before that yes we're bagging on his defense and he did make the improvements and we have to understand that but let's just marvel over the bat for a second because it's a hall of fame level bat i truly gotcha. believe so this guy hits the living piss out of everything that's in the zone everything he is a home run hitter he is a doubles hitter he's clutch when you need him he hits fastballs he hits changeups, sliders sinkers curveballs cutters all positive run value. He hits the ball in the air. If we're looking at like plate discipline, 77% zone contact percentage and doesn't really chase much. Like he's got plate discipline. He's got power. He's got bat to ball. He's got it all. He's as good of a hitter that we have in major league baseball. And he's freaking terrifying to face as a Yankee fan. Like there are two hitters right now. I think in the AL East that are the most terrifying him and Taylor walls. Not Taylor Walls, but Taylor Walls is probably three. If I had to yeah. make two, it's Vladdy and it's Devers. Yeah. These guys are just freaky. Bechette is in that range, but it's Devers and it's mm-hmm. Vladdy. And I'm sure that's the same for the rest of the American League. And when, you know, all the schedule changes and National League, like you'll see this guy hit. He is. He, the, he's just the crazy so thing good. about him, and like I think what makes him so terrifying, and I think what what makes Vladdy so terrifying too, is not only do they hammer pitches in the zone, they hammer terrible pitches. Like yeah. Devers is the king of hitting the eye level fastball for a double. Yeah, and the chase rate was really bad for Devers last year, but yeah, he goes up all the time. Like the yeah, high that's fastball, issue. that dude cannot lay off of it. But you know what? He puts it in play with ferocity enough. And then sometimes he hits those and they go out of the ballpark. Yeah, I know. Like, I've told the story before, so I'm going to keep it brief. But it just, it rang so true in my head because it's like one of those highlights that you remember every second of it. Yeah. When Roldis Chapman threw that up and away 102 mile an hour fastball and Devers hit it the opposite way at 21 out of the ballpark. Like, you're not, you can't do that. You're not supposed to do that and be called a human being. Because human beings don't do that. Human beings don't get in their back hip and spray 102 out and away the other way for a home run. You just, you're not allowed to do that if you want to be called a person of this planet. And sometimes yeah. Devers isn't a person of this earth because he's no. that good offensively. No. And if there's anybody that loves dip in baseball, man, oh. might I point you to his left cheek? Yeah, he's got a hammer and consistently. Yeah, one or he's a beast. It. Honestly, that's like a really impressive thing is yeah. like being able to do it with that much dip in your mouth. Like you got to be spinning your face off. Um, have I told the, the Wilson Ramos bullpen story no. uh, about, okay. So Wilson Ramos, I was at, I was at a Sox game at one point and Ramos was catching for the, for the opposing team. And I was standing by um, the opposing bullpen in right field at USA, a guaranteed right field. And Wilson Ramos looks up to like, a guy that's standing like five or six people away from me points does the little snap thing for a 10. He gets thrown down like a full can of dip and he palms like three quarters of it, throws it in and he just goes, catches a major league baseball game. It was like the craziest thing I've ever seen. Oh, he's so nasty, right? <laughs> it's nasty, but it's like, why is there a part of me that loves that? It's impressive. It's so no, cool. that just screams ball player a little bit. That's a ball player. That's a ball player, and I respect that. Player. But naturally, it's it's double bubble, right? It's it's gum for Devers for for you kids at home. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah. Number four. And this was a really tough stack with four and five. And this is, you know, what everybody spends the majority of the time on because the offensive numbers are so eerily similar. Austin Riley, we have ahead of Devers. Austin Riley is the fourth best third baseman in the game. Austin Riley was an MVP caliber hitter this past year. Five and a half wins, a 142 WRC plus in 159 games. He slashed 273, 349, 528, 38 nukes, 93 RBIs, 24% K rate, 8% walk rate. And he was a fine defensive third baseman. It's a very, very similar conversation to that of Devers. Um, Don't have to go too far into it. Dreadful defensive third baseman got better to the point where they were slightly below average, much like Devers, one of the best hitters on the planet, much like Devers. Why do you think we gave Riley the edge over Devers? Well, the reason I did is because I'm biased, Um, not Yankee Red Sox biased, not gambling biased. Austin Riley in the month of July will always be remembered here at Just Baseball because Austin Riley, we took his overhits, home run props all the time in July. And in July, the motherfucker had a 1344 OPS. Yeah. He hit 423 and slugged 885. He had 11 home runs in July last year. He was a literal tank engine. Like when he's rolling and he's hot, it's impossible to get out. Impossible. Because he's not the... A Eugenio Suarez type where he's striking out all the time, you know, 24% strikeout rate, 8% walk rate. Um, Obviously I'd like to see the walks come up and the strikeouts diminish a little bit, but if he does that, then he's one of the best players on the planet. Like there's only a few holes to find in his game outside of defense, I guess, but he was better in 2021, had a bit of a step back, but then just like hit everything. So what are we going to say? You know, Riley in back-to-back seasons, 38 bombs, or 33 bombs and 38 bombs. That's what you should expect. You should expect 35 home runs, 100 driven in, and a batting average in the 270 to 280 range with a 350 OBP. Like, that's that's really good. That's real good. I mean, that's really good. So So he's one of my favorite players in the game because I think life is really simple for Austin Riley. I agree. I stumbled upon his TikTok account. No way. He posted a couple videos. Yeah, I and I like don't peruse TikTok at all, but I, I think I was sent a video that Austin Riley posted, and I was like, oh, he's following eight people. I bet it's like the Braves, MLB, and a couple of like his teammates. Is it us? Let me walk you through his eight follows on TikTok. Okay. Bass Pro Shops, Banded Hunting Gear, Bone Collector, which is more like hunting stuff, Nathan Wilson, who is a hunter taxidermy guy, Last Mango Boat Works, Southeastern Sportsman, Real Tree Outdoors, and Luke Bryan. This guy listens to country music, hunts, and hits the shit out of baseballs, and that's it. Why does that make me so much more confident that he's going to do this forever? And yeah, no, why. I mean, it makes me more confident, too, because he doesn't think about baseball in his off time. No, 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 it's not that. He knows who he is. I like country, I like hunting and fishing, and I like hitting home runs. And I'm going to do it forever. (laughs) I I love it. That just made me like him even more. I know, I know. When I saw that, I was like, this guy's one of my favorite ballplayers in the game because I'm not a country music guy, I'm not a hunting guy, I'm not like an outdoor guy. But like, I saw that and I was like, this guy's really comfortable in his own skin. Like, Austin Riley would fit so well in a Patriots offense. Like, yeah, oh yeah. Just screaming at him, know your role, and he screamed back, don't worry, I do. Like, I, I know it. Exactly I know it. I've been prepped. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> All I do is fish, hunt, and hit homers. Like, do you want that? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, well, yes, please. We don't have this other outside stuff. He's not listening to pop and going bowling and riding motorcycles. I just hunt, I fish, and I hit homers. Yeah, we'll That's take that. Sick. That's sick. That's so sick. I'll take it. Especially in a place like Atlanta, too. Like, if he was in Miami, you know, like, maybe you're worried about outside distractions or whatever. Like, Atlanta, Georgia, it's pretty easy to just, like, go live in the burbs and get away on an off day and and go, you know, quail hunting or something. And, like, I I mean, dude, that guy just, it seems like he lives a very point A to point B lifestyle. And point C is hitting nukes. And he hit 38 of them. And now he's a $200 million player. I haven't listened to any post-game interviews of him. I'm going to infer that they're boring as shit. I'm so in on that, man. He's like, I'm not trying to do anything. All I'm trying to do is talk ball. And I love that. You know who else is boring as hell? Mike Trout. Love that. Prefer that. Everyone's like, we got to market the stars. Let them be them. 
Let them hit. I want to see them hey. on the field. I don't need them in a commercial. The right brands can pick up Austin Riley. I just alerted you. Bass Pro Shops, you got to deal with Austin Riley waiting for yeah, you right like now. New Balance did it with Kawhi, and Kawhi said like eight words in the past three years. Exactly. Hey, by the way, quick aside before we get to 1A, the next tier. Um, did you see Otani's uh, cleats now that just dropped with New Balance? He's a New Balance not. athlete. They're the um, they're the waffle like they're the waffle shoes. Um, I'll go grab mine real quick. But um, Otani, it's like the classic dad New Balance. It's like all tan. I'll pull up a photo on my iPad and they're baseball cleats. So like the classic dad New Balance shoe, but a cleat. It's so cool. It's cool or it's like Jack McMullen cool where it's not actually cool, but you like it. I'll, sh- I'll show the YouTube crowd in a minute. But first, let's tell you that Jose Ramirez, the Guardians, is the third best third baseman in baseball. And he starts the Holy Trinity that is better than any other position in the game. Yep. J-Ram has been called the most underrated player in baseball so many times that now he's just one of the best players in baseball. Jose Ramirez, 157 games last year. 280, 355, 514 slash 29 homers, 126 driven in, was near the top of Major League Baseball. He swiped 20 bags. 6.2 win guy, 139 WRC plus, 12% K rate, 10% walk rate, and he was a good defender. J Ram is one of the most well rounded players in the game, and he is one of the best players in the game. Yeah, down year though. 869 OPS versus an 890 the year before. Just took a massive step back. <laughs> He's so freaking good, ladies and gentlemen. He's good at everything. Remember what we were saying about Gutter? Like, maybe he could be Jose Ramirez? Yeah, we're here. It's Jose Ramirez. He does everything. He runs. He hits for power. He hits for average. He hits doubles. He gets on base. He plays good defense. He's an excellent base runner. He's a great leader. He's as good of a player that we have in the entire sport. Jose Ramirez has one issue. Last year, didn't hit lefties, 729 OPS, but he hit 919 OPS against righties. He had a tough second half. That's something we can actually talk about, 778 OPS. He had a tough second half. Um, but again, he's another guy who will should benefit a ton from the shift. Yeah, I mean, you can rank him first. I wouldn't care. He's awesome. Love him so much. He's one of my favorite players in the sport. He's incredible. But didn't have the 2022 that our top two guys did. So that's what puts him at three. But then again, like, could be two or one easily. Here are the Correct. shoes. Yeah. Here's the cool. gift for the YouTube crowd the Otani new cleats, the 574. These are awesome. I got to be honest. My first reaction to those is very disappointed. Very no, disappointed. No, they look like the most comfortable cleat in the game, man. Yeah, maybe. But it's Shohei Otani. Like, you're a freak athlete. It's like the Bo Nose campaign. Like, I wish we had something insane for a guy who hits and pitches. No, dude, those are in, man. No, those are so in. You like God, those? You're missing the boat. I love them. No, first reaction is I hate them, bro. They're so good. I'm gonna tweet them out and see if people love them. Yeah, um, yeah, man. I mean, J Ram just so well rounded. Like, what else can we say about him? So yeah. might as well move on to two. That, that's why it's like when we get into this part, we can pull up like really cool stats and be like, look how good he is. You probably haven't heard this before, but it's like. He's good at everything, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Good at everything. Not good like Austin Riley. Great at hitting for power and hitting for average. He's a great hitter. Not great on the base pass. Not a great defender. Not J-Ram. There is not one thing in his game that you can point to and be like, eh, that's not very good. Nothing. Can you find anything? I couldn't find anything. I was looking for holes to be like, this is why he's three. I can't. It's just... He had a little bit of a worse year than two and one. So, and yeah. he's not the defender that two and one are. So there you go. Right. There's the hole, but he's still great. Same deal with this guy. Um, and, and this guy, I think is, is one of my favorite players in the game. Nolan Arenado with the St. Louis Cardinals is the second best third baseman in baseball. 148 games in 2022. He slashed 293, 358, 533, 30 homers, 103 driven in, seven and a half win player, 7.3 F4, a 151 WRC plus, 11.5% K rate, doesn't punch out, 8.5% walk rate, walks enough, 19 defensive runs saved, 15 outs above average. This guy has never played a full season, which he hasn't won a gold glove. But that's it for a moment. 
six oh. platinum gloves. If he has played an entire year, he's won the gold glove that year. I didn't know that. Every year? Really? Every year. His baseball reference is one of the most underrated baseball references to look at. Because you, for some reason, love, like, silver sluggers. Like, you love being like, this guy's a silver slugger award winner. Don't I'm you? all about it. Nolan Arenado has played 10 seasons. He has 10 gold gloves. Like, I think this is such a cool um, list right here. Uh, just moving on to the bat a little bit. So, the top 10 in strikeout rate, like, the bottom. Like, Luis Arise is number one at 7.1%. Yeah, and, like, Quan's up there. Yeah, yeah, Quan's up there. McNeil, Alejandro Kirk, Yanni Diaz is up there. Nico Horner at number six. Then seven through nine, seven is Arenado, eight is Alex Bregman, and number nine is Jose Ramirez. These guys are so good. Like, because they don't sacrifice the swing and miss, but they still have all the power that you want. And they still defend like nobody's business, and they walk, and they, they're they just so damn good. Arenado is on his way to being a first ballot Hall of Famer. Goldschmidt should be a Hall of Famer. He won't be first ballot like Arenado. He won't go down as one of the best first basemen of all time like Arenado will at third base. Goldschmidt will be up there, but Arenado's going to be in the conversation with the Chipper Joneses of the world and the Mike Schmitz of the world and like the best third baseman of all time. Like he is going to be up there. He's going to be a 400 home run guy when it's all said and done with like 70 gold gloves and be like a 280 career hitter with close to what, 2,500 hits? Like he yeah. is going to go down as one of the best of all time at the position. So Brooks Robinson has 16 gold gloves. He's the all-time leader at third base. Um, Arenado has 10, and he's 31 years old. Um, there is a, a page, and if you listen to yesterday's show, we did it. We we scrolled down to the black ink with, with Goldschmidt and with Freddie Freeman, and we looked at similarity scores and like seven-year war and all that. It's Hall of Fame statistics on baseball reference. And Arenado, while he's not there in terms of war accumulation, He's 31 years old. He's got 52 career war. The average for a Hall of Fame third baseman is 68. He can get 16 more war in his career. Promise you that. He can do that in three years. Um, Seven-year peak. The average seven-year peak of a Hall of Fame third baseman accounted for 43 war. Arenado's seven-year peak at this point is 44.6 war. Arenado, if you look at similarity scores... Similar hitters through their age 31 season. Scott Rowland, Chipper Jones, Gary Sheffield, Evan Longoria, Ernie Banks, Mark Teixeira, Carlos Lee, Aramis Ramirez. He's Those a better are defender all, than all of them. They're all incredible names. So when you have that offensive profile, and I hear it, Coors Field, whatever, we he averages it. 40 doubles, 35 homers, and 115 driven in over 162. There you go. And he hit 30 and drove in 100 last year. What do you want? And he's one of the best defensive players in all of baseball. He's won six platinum gloves. He's one but, of the best defenders ever. Yes, correct. Uh, he's going to be one of the best third basemen ever, like you're saying. But this guy is going to be as well. Manny Machado going into the 2023 season is the best third baseman in the game. 150 games slash 298, 366, 531. 32 homers, 102 driven in, 7.4 F4, a 152 WRC plus. He had a 21% K rate, a 10% walk rate, negative three defensive run save, but eight outs above average. Manny Machado is as well-rounded of a player as you will find in the game. Um, he was both of our NL MVP pick last year. We gave Machado the slight edge over Goldschmidt. Goldschmidt ended up winning it. No qualms there. Uh, but Manny is here to stay, and he is now, Taylor Davis alerted me to this, the only player in Major League history to sign two $300 million contracts. Wow. Here's why Machado is number one. He can <clears throat> field like Arenado. He can hit no, better he than it. Yeah, he can. He's close. He's close. He's not there, but he's close. Okay. He's, if Arenado's a 10 on defense, he's a nine. Yeah. 
He's a 10 on offense at the position. He's as good of a hitter that we have in Major League Baseball. But what takes him over the top, for me, may not be for you, but for me. You know how I like going to the clutch rankings on Fangraphs? They have like a clutch stat. So guys like Bregman, guys like J-Ram, other guys on this list, they're towards the bottom because what clutch is, is it's how much better are you than average, right? So if a guy like Arenado has a 130 WRC plus during the regular season, and in clutch situations, he has a 120 WRC plus. Still really good, but it's below what he normally does. So it's like he's clutch because he's a good player in good situations, but it's not compared to his averages. Do you know of all qualified third baseman who was the clutchest in baseball last year? It sounds like this guy. Manny Machado. Second to Brandon Jury, but he played so many different positions. So it was like tough, not of qualified third baseman who played every day at third. Brandon Jury, you could say is number one and it's fine. But of the real third baseman, Machado was number one. Manny Machado come playoffs. Like if you watch that series, it seems like he beat him by himself. It was like the one time where I'm like, this guy is the reason the Dodgers aren't winning. Because yeah. Mookie Betts had about a thousand hard liners to third base when Machado's at third just scooped him up like nothing. He had a 152 WRC plus in the playoffs last year. Yeah. He got better than what he did in the regular season, which was an MVP candidate. Yeah. He's he unlocked is, a new and, he's unlocked a new narrative. Oh, I was gonna be like, he's a free agent, but he just locked in to the contract. So the narrative isn't there. That's why I was honestly looking at him for National League MVP is like a sprinkle because I'm like, he's gonna go crazy. Now that's out the window, but still, I mean, yeah, he got his bag, but yeah, he MLB network ranked him as the fifth best overall player in major league baseball. A little what high. Did you have him at? I think I had him at eleven, maybe twelve. I'll pull it up right now. Um, yeah, man. I mean, he has changed the narrative around him, though, which is really cool. Oh, yeah. Like, he was the crazy good talent that lacked some maturity, and now he is, like, the captain of the Padres, which is really neat. Yeah, really cool, right? When uh, Tatis came over, obviously there was the videos of Machado yelling at him. Machado's really taken on a leadership role when I remember he was, like, throwing bats at Josh Donaldson or something like that. Or I remember he took a swing and like chucked his bat over at third base. I don't know if it was Donaldson. It probably was because Donaldson's a piece of shit. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you've got Machado at 11. Yeah. I think that's a I don't know, top. I don't know. He's the fifth best player in major league baseball. I mean, he's yeah. up there. He's up. I agree there. with the list that you have. Thank you. No notes. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Flawless. <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean, so let, let's run through it one more time here. Machado is the best, um, but we'll count down. Um, our three honorable mentions, Key Brian Hayes, Max Muncy, Anthony Rendon, Yandy Diaz, 10, Eugenio Suarez, 9, Gunnar Henderson, 8, Matt Chapman, 7, Alex Bregman, 6, Rafi Devers, 5, Austin Riley, 4, Jose Ramirez, 3, Nolan Arenado, 2, and Manny Machado, the best third baseman in the game. Taking a lot of their time. Do we want to just say bye? We can um, make sure if you do want to check out my subscription, it was greatly appreciated. We uh, talked about at the beginning of the podcast. That's in the episode description. Great way to support the podcast. Get yourself some merch. Jack's holding up the hat. I'm wearing the hat too. It's a good time to get yourself some just baseball stuff. Um, but if you know you don't want to spend a dime, we totally understand. If you could rate this podcast five stars on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. And if you've been enjoying on YouTube, hit us with a like. Comment your top 10 third baseman and hit that subscribe button for baseball videos all season long. We have a ton of podcasts on the network. Something I'm really excited to announce. I'm not going to quite yet until we submit it, but I'm starting a new podcast with uh, with a friend of mine, and he happens to be in Major League Baseball. So we'll be talking about that soon. Yes. And with that, thank you, everybody.